Censorship. A hindrance to any form of expression, censorship has long been a controversial topic in the music industry. Yet despite its ongoing debate, many are still divided. The Parents Music Resource Center was a group from the 1980s founded by the Washington Wives, wives of influential politicians and business owners in DC. They aim to put a stop to so-called porn rock through what many considered censorship. The musicians they were targeting felt like their plans were an unnecessary infringement on their freedom of speech rights, and it was a stand taken by the musicians, not to be a mercy, that began a lasting conversation about the way music is interpreted that is still going on today. It started in the early 80s, when Tipper Gore, the wife of then-Senator and later Vice President Albert Gore, bought her young daughter the soundtrack to the R-rated movie Purple Rain. At first, everything seemed okay, but once track 5, Darling Nikki, began to play, Gore said, I was stunned, then I got mad. Luckily, her daughter didn't understand the references in the song, but after hearing it, Gore decided she needed to do more research on the popular songs the children of America were listening to. Her friends experienced the same problem. Susan Baker told Newsweek she didn't have a clue that her seven-year-old would be exposed to inappropriate songs. Thus, the Parents Music Resource Center was born. According to Tipper, they aim to inform the public of the growing trend in music towards lyrics that are sexually explicit, excessively violent, or glorify the use of drugs and alcohol. Their execution, however, was far more intense. The PMRC held the view that rock music contributed to the growing trend of rape and suicide between the age of 16 and 24. In order to combat this, they made a statement requesting record companies either cease the production of music with violent and sexually charged lyrics or develop a motion picture style rating system for albums. The idea of record labeling so parents would be alerted when there was graphic material. Why are parents and teachers and doctors concerned about graphic lyrics in young children? There's a way to deal with that with respect for freedom. There was more to this plan though that artists like Dee Snyder, Frank Zappa, and John Denver believed would endanger their artistic freedom. The Parents Music Resource Center released a list of demands, including number one, print lyrics on album covers, Number two, keep explicit covers under the counter. Number three, establish a rating system for records similar to that for films. Number four, establish a rating system for concerts. Number five, reassess the contracts of performers who engage in violence and explicit sexual behavior on stage. Number six, establish a citizen and record company media watch that would pressure broadcasters not to air questionable talent. They also released a list they called the Filthy Fifteen. 15 songs that demonstrated the type of music they wanted banned. On this list were songs like We're Not Gonna Take It by Twisted Sister, Into the Coven by Merciful Fate, and of course, Darling Nikki by Prince. The Recording Industry Association of America was too slow for their liking and their response, so to speed up the spread of their message, the members traveled the country giving press conferences and talking to other concerned parents about how best to help their children. At this point, the PMRC had solidified their place in media coverage, and in some cases became a household name. However, this marked the beginning of what could turn out to be the downfall of many musicians' careers. Shortly after the PMRC's release of demands, Reverend Jimmy Swagger urged retailers to stop carrying what was thought of as inappropriate music, an action that led big stores like Walmart and Sears to pull these types of records and magazines that promoted them off their shelves. The artists who were targeted by the PMRC were at first confused. Cronus, the singer for the band Venom, said he thought someone was pulling a prank on him to see his reaction. But when he realized they were a determined organization, he said, I couldn't understand how supposedly intelligent people could be so ignorant. It's rock and roll. It's supposed to be hardcore and edgy. Musicians believed the PMRC and their affiliates were judging them by their outward personas, not thinking there was a person underneath. And so they decided to take action. While at the time their side seemed too little to make a true difference, the stand musicians like Dee Snyder, Frank Zappa, and John Denver took against the PMRC affected the way people viewed the debate on censorship. These musicians, who contributed to extremely different genres of music, took the same steps as the PMRC. 
going on TV and airing their opinions about the alleged issue. Many of them believed the PMRC was overstepping their bounds, especially when it came to privilege and power and shouldn't be interfering in how the parents of America raise their children. And we need to take these words out to protect the youth. That also will translate ultimately into we need to take these ideas out. And when they have control over all the ideas that go on to a record, there will be no useful information going to the kids at all. But I think it's, it's, it's a very, it's a stupid way to go about it. If I recorded a song that talked about a person who was downtrodden in life, just nobody would give him a chance, and he was, he was suicidal. If, if Ozzy Osbourne records it, that's offensive. But if Donny Osmond records it, it's a fact of life. He could say, I don't like it, but what we're saying is, do you want to let parents guide their kids, or do you want to let the police step in and say, you can't do this? See, parents should say, don't do the IT record, and that's the end of it. After months of indirect debate through the media, the Parents Music Resource Center used their DC contacts and were allowed time in front of a congressional committee to argue the need for stickers that showed the inappropriate nature of some music. But Dee Snyder, Frank Zappa, and John Denver, three very different musicians, also appeared and testified against the PMRC. The PMRC proposal is an ill-conceived piece of nonsense which fails to deliver any real benefits to children infringes the civil liberties of people who are not children, and promises to keep the courts busy for years dealing with the interpretational and enforcemental problems inherent in the proposal's design. This would approach censorship. May I be very clear that I'm strongly opposed to censorship of any kind in our society or anywhere else in the world. Parents can thank the PMRC for reminding them that there is no substitute for parental guidance, but that is where the PMRC's job ends. These three men were extremely nervous. This entire situation had been based on the idea that their careers were inevitably inappropriate. Appearing before Senate meant they had a real chance to change the public's perception of them and other musicians. When I first walked into the Senate hearing room uh, in my snakeskin boots and my skin tightening jeans, my cut off denim, my, my wearing mascara, I was ready for battle. When I sat down and I started to speak for a brief moment, the magnitude, the reality of it hit me, and I, my hand literally started to shake. Uh, I was holding my, my speech, and just, you know, because all of a sudden, I mean, I'm, I was born in the 50s. This is Washington, D.C. These were senators and congressmen and important people, and what the hell was I doing there? Before the hearings were over, the Recording Industry Association of America agreed to a voluntary parental advisory sticker that, while now obsolete, is still in use today. Despite this limit put on records released after the hearings, it was much lesser than what was originally proposed. By no means is the debate on censorship close to being resolved, but the actions taken by musicians who stood up for themselves against the PMRC effectively flipped the narrative, reminding many that there was a second side to the argument, the artists themselves. Music is a powerful tool. It unites, it separates, and it fuels the soul. In the 1980s, two stands were taken both regarding the censorship of music, and it was a stand taken by the musicians that saved music and allowed it to be what it is today.